you know, that's all, who knows what will happen. If you really feel excited, you gotta jump in, then just by all means, just go ahead and jump in. And thank John for doing this. This is a, a really wonderful, and should I just start with the questions? Go for it, okay. So actually, there's a really, uh, uh, one of the first questions about the fact that you started out as a, studying engineering. And, uh, and then you find yourself in this area of design. So what was that journey from engineering to design like? Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I think, uh, you know, people talk about a, like a straight career path. Mm -hmm. I think I have had a jagged career path, jagged line. Mm -hmm. And um, I never quite uh, understood where I was supposed to be. And because of that, I had the opportunity to have to make stuff up. Yeah. Um, and I'll never forget when I, because um, I have a typical uh, Asian immigrant working class family. And so like, you know, everyone wanted us to go to MIT or Harvard. So I remember getting to MIT. It was like, great, he got to MIT. And then I was my first year and all the upperclassmen were studying for this test called the GRE. And I thought, what's the GRE? I took the SATs. And they said, this is where I'm gonna go to graduate school. And I never heard of graduate school. So I called up my dad and said, Dad, there's something called graduate school. And he said, you better go to it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was always kind of like making it up. So uh, whether it's engineering, going, doing what my father wanted me to do, and mm -hmm. going to design in the arts was something I was able to do because he told me that I could make a living. So go do, do what you want to do, went to the arts, and then came back and have kind of waffled all over the place. But I want to thank President Sohil for the, uh, and, her, and her leadership team for pulling this together. Not an easy thing, especially in the middle of the convocation storm that's happening on campus. Not an easy thing. So I want to thank you for that, you know. And it's been uh, really nice to get to do this. Uh, when I heard that I might be able to get to do this, I was uh, really excited. So thanks for this. And people, are, people who are somewhere not here, but they're kind of here. I appreciate them as well. Um, <laughs> and then Professor Wakari has been this, this amazing representative of the faculty that you get to work with. And by, re by, by re reciprocation, the students that he gets to um, be a part of. So I'm glad to be in that space. It's really amazing. Yeah, well, we're happy that you're in the mix and, and in, in with us. And it's really, uh, that's really great. And, you know, so you talked about so this journey, and we actually, you've, you've mentioned a lot of people in the time I've been with you, and you also mentioned the convocation, different people that you've looked up to and so on. So yeah. I'm curious, can you tell us which mentors along the way, the people that you've uh, looked to along the way, that have uh, really been important to you? Well, I think in, uh, in terms of the design world, Paul Rand was a transformative figure. And now I think about what Paul Rand was saying, and now it makes more sense, um, uh, because I, I was in, in, in engineering school, never knew about design. I never knew it existed. So um, I found a design book by accident in MIT's library, written by a guy named Paul Rand. And I found it kind of really weird how like years later I'd be visiting a studio mm -hmm. when he's 81 and just like, you know, hanging out with Paul Rand and it was pretty crazy. Uh, studio, studios in Connecticut, Western Connecticut. I went to visit him and um, I was flying in from Japan and I had an appointment for like a half an hour from like 8 to 8.30. So I showed up and I got in the cab, got out of the cab, and there he is. And he just opens the door and says, um, my assistant is sick today, so you'll have to work for me for free. <laughs> and I said, oh, OK, that's pretty cool, you know? So I kind of like sat down at his computer, and he had his Quark Express. And, you know, like, you know, and, and uh, it was the last pages that had to go to the uh, printer for his book, his last book, From yeah. Last Go to Brooklyn. And so I'm working all day long on his thing, you know, and then. How do they know what Quark Express is? Quark Express, they preceded yeah, Adobe yeah. InDesign, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. it's like after Microsoft Word, like <laughs> to look at the history of yeah, computing. You're yourself, yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so I remember just working with him that day, and it was a weird experience getting to, like, you know, do diagrams and drawing, and it was, I, I kind of like, a, I said to him, oh, excuse me, Mr. Rand, the rag of this page is kind of off, and he looked at me and said, if I say it's right, it's right. <laughs> so I was like, whoa, I like gotta put that, you know, if I put the line back, totally okay. I mean, you know, I didn't touch that, you know, and, uh, and uh, I remember he said to me, he got very quiet, and he said to me, um, young man, 
I have something very important to tell you. And it's very dramatic, you know, because you're, you're here alone with this guy. He's 81 years old. He finds his book. He says, make lots of money. <laughs> and I was like, really, no, you didn't say that to me, did you? <laughs> it's like, you know, says, make lots of money. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, it isn't like you think it is. It's like everything that he said he'd ever done made no money. Any, the books he designed, which mm -hmm. he made, you can kind of find now on eBay and things like that, but they were all printed in five color. And a university press would never print them in five colors, so he paid for them by himself. So everything he did that he loved to do, he just paid to do because he would make money off of his other jobs, which paid the bills. And so I just thought that was the most pragmatic way to look at things. You know, sometimes you hear people say, you know, don't worry about the money. Just make your work and go and like work as a waitress or waiter or, you know, make that coffee because someday the world will find you is a very romantic view of the world. So I think his thinking helped me understand that, well, you know what? Find out what you can do to make money to fund what you really love to do. Sometimes they intersect. It's very rare, but um, that advice is important to me. The second piece of advice to me from a person who wasn't Paul Wren was a Rosa. Mm. I don't know her last name because I called her Mrs. Something and she called told me that demanded that I call her Rosa. But she worked at the president's house. And uh, she was someone who would come in uh, like, uh, for like half days and uh, help to keep I had a mansion. You know, you think of like Snoop Dogg style mansion. <laughs> As President Rizdi, it was like 16 rooms and like five bathrooms. And I lived alone, kind of like Bruce Wayne, sort of, you know. <laughs> um, and, um, and she was always there and she'd make everything, you know. And, and then uh, there, were, there were days where, you know, we just talk and, you know, because I was always rushing around to events, you know. I was watching President Petter and thinking, wow, that used to be my life. It's run, 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 run. You know, he's so fit. <laughs> uh, but um, one small, you know, talk to Rosa. And Rosa, and Rosa would always give me advice at an important time. She said, John, you're president. You should act with more power. You know, or like, John, you should just, she would always just kind of like come in, you know, like that. And, uh, most of the people who were the groundskeepers and uh, people who took care of the buildings were all uh, Portuguese immigrants. Mm -hmm. and I was just coming with a thick accent, just coming to me. And then um, one day she told me this story that helped reframe my role as president. And, you know, every actor on the campus is making this learning environment, whether it's the students taking leadership, you know, or it's like anyone doing something is part of the ecosystem. And so, Rosa said to me that she um, used to work in the, uh, the, the quad, the dormitories, and she would clean uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the dormitories. And she said one time she was um, mopping the floor on one floor, you know, with a bucket of water, and she was mopping the floor, you know, and then, and then one day a student came by and kicked over the bucket. And she was instructed not to say anything, you know, because, well, maybe, you know, students, whatever, just let, let them be there or whatever. But she said, I had to say something, John. So I said, hey, you kicked over my bucket. And then she said he turned around and looked at her and said, hmm, you know, sort of walking off. And then someone in the hallway, his door was open. And a young man stepped out and said, hey, that could be your mother. Apologize to her. And looked at him and was like, hmm, just walks down the hallway. And Rosa said, and then at the end of the hallway, he turned around and looked at me and said, well, I don't have enough meal points to eat lunch. I'm just out of meal points. I'm really hungry. You know, I'm in a really bad mood. And Rosa said, well, then I said to him, well, I found that $10 bill that you dropped upstairs. And he said, what $10 bill? Oh, no, no, you dropped it upstairs. <laughs> he was on the floor. He said, I didn't drop a $10. No, no, I dropped it. You dropped it. I found it. So here, here he is, a $10 bill. And so he took the $10 bill, and she said to me, John, from that day on, that young man opened the door for me. <laughs> He'd ask me how my family is. And uh, to me, I thought, you know, education is a vaunted thing. Yeah. But at that moment, that student got an important lesson yeah. from who you wouldn't think is, you know, giving you the learning experience. So 
It was Paul Rand and Rosa, that combination, I think, uh, helped me well, see Well, these are things. like bookend mentors, and it's kind of nice to know you could still be mentored. You'd be president yeah. of the, a RISD, and you're still yeah. looking for mentors, and they can come from anywhere. And oh, yeah. yeah. I learn a lot from people. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions is about, they really just kind of want to drill down, want to know what do you do on a day-to-day -day level oh, to day -day keep productive. Yeah, yeah. What, so give what us your, give us the, yeah, give us the what John day, in day, day in the life. Uh, yeah, what's the script? What's the script? There is yeah. no script. Uh, there used to be a script um, as president. Now I kind of have no script. Now I like, I uh, rent an Airbnb in Palo Alto. I don't have a car. I use UberX everywhere. UberX is kind of like hitchhiking, uh, but you pay for it. Um, and I'm just kind of like, um, uh, time is uh, primarily at Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield and Byers, uh, which is a venture capital company, uh, which I knew nothing about. I knew nothing about venture capital until January 2nd when I walked in and um, had to learn what venture capital is. Um, I have to say that six months in, now I understand what it is. Um, and based upon understanding, I'm helping to do three things. First is to help different companies in the portfolio understand design. Um, the second thing is to find new opportunities uh, in which um, uh, the firm can invest. And the third is I'm synthetically making new opportunities out of people that I know, kind of like in a mixed person A, mixed person B, and see, <laughs> psh, oh no. So <laughs> try this, you know, and uh, so three types of things. And so I'm just cycling between those kinds of activities. And I'm also advising the CEO of the eBay companies um, and um, the CEO that wants to put design into his company, design culture in his company. So I'm engaging uh, this very large uh, global company on helping them understand how to use design inside mm -hmm. um, uh, their products. Okay. But no pattern, just jumps all over the place. Yeah, like a playlist, you know? <laughs> you want to hit shuffle? <laughs> it's like that. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about that and spending time with you. And, and you mentioned in, in the complication piece you're a nonlinear thinker. And I was yeah. trying to get in your head a little bit and trying to think, okay, there's your business, you got design, mm -hmm. you got technology, you got art, you got engineering. These don't all get along. Yeah. How do they get along in your head? How, 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 do, how do you reconcile these different uh, methods, different approaches? Well, I, if anything, it's made me more sensitive to people who feel a certain way. Mm -hmm. Like, um, the, the problem with having an identity is that you're stuck inside that kind of view of who you are. Uh, the problem of not having identity is that no one will let you be your friend. So it's kind of like, you know, which way do you want to be? Do you want to be truly alone across, or do you want to be, you know, truly unalone and, and be comfortable? So I think as, as any artist would want to be, and you, you don't want to be too comfortable, because once you're too comfortable, you kind of like stop challenging yourself. Mm -hmm. So one thing I've learned a lot is how we stereotype. You know, this is not a, not a big thought, um, you know, I think about how like engineers are the nerds, you know, they sit there with their Cheetos and like code and stuff and the designers wear like, you know, black turtlenecks and have really good glasses and they're kind of like sitting there with their rulers and stuff and whatever, you know, and um, well, like business people, all they care about is money, you know, and they sit there counting the money like, like you know, Uncle Scrooge, you know, Donald Duck, whatever, you know, and, and um, I think we see these things and they're reinforced in the movies mm. and the literature. So we get lost a bit. Uh, but what I see in, in all fields is that you have remarkable people and average people. And in the average people, you have people who are very happy with what they do and they like to be who they are. And they're not trying too hard. So if I'm a business person, I'll care about money. If I'm a designer, I love design. If I'm an engineer, I love to code. And then you have people who are like, truly remarkable are the ones who kind of just sit there like, I don't know, I kind of like that stuff over there too. Maybe I'll hang out with that person. Maybe I'll try some of that. Or, you know, those people with money, are they really that bad? <laughs> you know, gonna hang out with them, you know? And so like, um, because people said to me like, venture capital, capitalists, the sharks, they're people who like, all they want is, you know? And I think, what? Well, I've met a lot of Swiss typographers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're crazy. <laughs> You're like, oh, that's off by point zero zero one points. And yeah. no one can see that. Oh, I can see it. Yeah. And yeah. so, so every, every discipline has its own fanatics. 
So one might be fanatical about money, one might be fanatical about space, one might be fanatical about optimizing the thing, dot, 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 zero, zero, one, whatever. So it's all about excellence. So excellence is a good thing, hmm. I think. Um, respecting each other's So that sort of cuts across all of this. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing to be curious about what the other person does because you're going to learn something mm -hmm. and you're going to look stupid. Mm -hmm. And that's what I learned uh, when I was um, uh, a, a student, a young professor, is that um, there was this really smart professor. I was like, oh my gosh, that guy like invented like pyramid coding and all these things that were like really hard and whatever he knows, Polaroid X, whatever, Polaroid, whatever he knows, super scientist, maybe he's going to have a Nobel Prize, whatever. And he just walked into meeting people and stuff. He said, I don't understand that. Yeah. He's like, he yeah. doesn't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> he's supposed to understand everything. And you're like, oh my gosh. You know? But no one's going to say, oh, he's dumb. He's really dumb. He's really stupid. I, was like, I thought that that was nice to walk into something and ask questions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I feel stupid a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's getting used to that. It's been like an exercise. <laughs> like, oh, God, you know, not again. Yeah, so it's helpful. Well, so, so I have a question here, and someone obviously did their homework. They've been reading interviews, and they, they actually uh, quoted you. They said, in one of your interviews, you oh said, no. yeah, yeah. Um, let me get it right. They, they said oh. that uh, you prefer to be in changing environments. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I did say that. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so how do you respond as, you know, changing environments? Well, you're in one now. You're always yeah. in one. So how does that, why is that? Why is that? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I've just been, ex I, I, I've been like uh, bombarded by fortune cookie wisdom. Uh, <laughs> I used to go to a Chinese restaurant near MIT all the time, and it was back when fortune cookies were real fortune cookies. I'm not sure how it is in Vancouver. Probably it's a little better because it's such a strong Asian population, yeah. but I don't think so. No. I think there is one company exactly. somewhere that makes fortune cookies, and they make them individually wrapped. Is that right? Do you get those individual wrapped ones? Yep. You can't trust an individual wrapped fortune cookie because it hasn't been hanging out with others. It's been sitting in this bubble. Now, what can it know is what I think. So when I get to like, ah, oh, you know, but in the old days, they were like in a pile, <laughs> right? A pile. They were like hanging out, you know? And I was like, oh, what's in there? You know, you pick it, whatever, you pick the one you want. And so I have so many fortune cookies. And the general theme of some fortune cookies that are less dark, mm. um, are this notion that, hey, you're doing great. <laughs> you know, like, you're doing really great. Um, you're doing great in spite of dot, dot, dot. So, and the, usually the in spite of dot, 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 the dot, dot, dot is facing some kind of challenge. So I equate some kind of challenge as always a challenge to change, mm -hmm. you know? So when you, when you face a challenge, you're going to have to, like, you know, Transformers, you know, like, the car's coming along, it's like, whoops, you know, there's sky, the truck's going to become an airplane, right? Otherwise, it's going to go over, right? Or, you, you know, no one wants to go over the cliff. And so you have to, but if you were sitting at home, if you're a Transformer car sitting back like this, you know, like, ah, oh, you know, there's no cliff. Mm -hmm. But once the Transformer car leaves the house, they're screwed because something is going to happen. <coughs> and when something happens, you ask yourself, do I have what it takes to overcome that? Mm -hmm. um, and that requires change. Mm -hmm. So can you give us an example, one, maybe one that maybe people don't know about where you feel oh, like Oh, yeah. Really Simple change. Like, like, let's say like, you were a college president, and everything is going pretty well good. You know? And then like, some people call you and say, hey, you know, we want to work in venture capital. I know nothing about venture capital. OK. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so that change was uh, quite large for me mm. um, because number one, I had no idea what that industry was. Number two, I'd be working with some of the best people in the industry. Um, and so I had to figure out really quickly what it was and would I survive? I don't know. So far I've survived. I'm not saying I'm like coasting. Uh, I'm billing water a lot, you know, like, oh my gosh, ever seen a, uh, Robert Redford's uh, movie. Oh, and the he's in the sailboat? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I'm going to die. No, I wake up. You know, I'm going <laughs> to die. No, I'm still alive. I'm supposed to be dead. No, I'm going to keep going. Um, so it's coming back. Yeah. Mm. He does die, though, doesn't he? No, I won't tell you the ending. All right, sorry. Sorry, yeah. I ruined it for a bit. Um, yeah. So, and one thing, so this relates to something else, and it's not one of the questions, but we've been talking about this a little bit failure. Mm. Failure is very important. So, changing failure. So, so, 
and we talked about how we don't think people fail enough. Mm -hmm. So do you want to say something about failure or the importance yeah. of failure? Well, you know, Rocco Landisman, who used to be the chairman of the National Endowment of the Arts, would say that it isn't that creative people like to fail, it's that they productively fail. And productive failure is an important theme. And, and I think that the reason why the arts are a useful place to practice failure is because, quite frankly, it's all simulation. Mm -hmm. Like, if you make like a wrong, poorly designed X, people are not going to die. I say that in an important context. Some fields, if you do the wrong thing, it impacts many human lives. As design gets more socially motivated, that'll happen more often. But generally, if you're doing something on a page, you're not going to hurt mankind. So you can experiment a lot. You can keep iterating, you know? And so you learn how to iterate. The question is, when you take that same high-speed iteration skill, the ability to fail on paper, to things that involve people, that's where there's a gigantic gulf. So when you fail and people are involved, when you let people down, right, then what happens is like, you know, like, let's say you, were, you took the effort to make the room. Oh my gosh, the room's not here. Oh shit. You know, like, excuse me. You know, like, oh no, you know, like, what have I done? Like, where is the room? I don't know where the room is. Or like, well, there's no food. Oh no. So this all compound. Whereas if you were sitting there making a poster, like, event, see you there, there's no people like angry at you yet. So leading, making things involving people, that kind of failure is very hard. So people will run back to the paper because it's safe there. Um, that's why I'm such a proponent of. Uh, people asking questions about how to lead. Uh, I wrote a book called Redesigning Leadership, which is my first two years being president. And most sitting presidents don't write books on being the president, especially in the middle of a vote no confidence from the faculty. <laughs> and people are like, whoa, what's this book? You know, who do you think you are? You know? But if you read the book, I'm not saying I'm anything. I'm like, I don't really understand this thing. You know, how do you lead? Mm. How do you lead in difficult financial times? What do you do? If you're a creative person, you want to do things the right way, but everything you do impacts more people. It cascades. So how do you navigate that as a creative person, someone who's used to iterating fast? Because maybe you can change quickly, but 10 people around you can't change quickly with you. So how do you balance that ability to, to fail? Um, how do you navigate that? How do you feel to, to be failing? Um, how, does that, how does that work? Um, how do you overcome that? Um, that's a question I think I, mm -hmm. I have struggled with and worked on and um, found a place to, to feel around. And that is simply that, you know, if you didn't bother to try, everyone else wouldn't have, wouldn't have a, had a thing here. Maybe something I say here, like a second, might be useful, you know? And then you help to enable that. Or maybe everything I said is going to depress them all today. And oh, oh look out, the email's going to come. Like, oh my gosh, she was so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you, you play, you're, you're gambling. Uh, but what you get to do is you get to create culture and create possibility. Um, and in that, you change society, which is a whole different kind of paper. And that paper is the kind of paper that the medium that people need the kind of skills that creative people have. Think of Airbnb. Airbnb didn't exist four years ago. I was at a restaurant, a cafe in San Francisco. These two guys, cute, two cute guys, you know, Brian Chesky, Joe Gebbia, they're working in their apartment, you know, got this idea, I'm gonna rent out your room in your house. Strangers are gonna stay there. It's crazy, you know, to three years later, it's now evaluated at like some $6 billion company. Uh, on any given night, more people stay in Airbnb than all of Hilton hotels worldwide. How's that possible? It's because you had people who knew how to think differently, could grow with the leadership problem, challenge, opportunity, and shift and, sh and change. There'll be more people like that to come. So that's, that's good. actually a good segue to the next question, which is about maybe articulating a little further you talk a lot about creative leadership or creative leaders, mm -hmm. and, and, and so what is that you know, in respect to traditional leadership? What does that, and for people particularly who are getting their education in a creative yeah. field, how do they bring that toward leadership? Well, um, well there's two things. The first is that um, 
A creative leader um, is uh, essentially, um, well, to create means you're making. Now, this is not good because think about, think about if like the, the, the shift manager at McDonald's were creative, right? It's like, no, 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 go ahead, make French fries your own way. <laughs> you know, like, you're over there, the, the, you know, the kind of drive through make it up, you know? And, and why wouldn't that work? It's because it's a process, optimized for, for speed, creativity has been removed from the equation, so I can get my French fries in roughly 13 seconds, and people do not collapse inside the kitchen. That's good non-creativity. Um, where you do need creativity uh, is when the conditions are changing. Let me give, for example, the McDonald's example. Let's say McDonald's ship manager comes in and suddenly the, the oil thing explodes, sort of. No one's hurt. They're, it's, it's, the, it's like a football game or basketball game. People are like lining up like this. It's like the best time ever for customers. You know? If the person just follows a robotic manual, like, uh, I will now press a button and franchise will come out. That's not going to work. So a creative person is particularly useful when the conditions of the problem have now shifted. We talked about that in the car. Yeah. And so only if you have a situation of change is creative leadership actually useful and also acceptable. As artists, you actually want to do the hardest thing in your life. You want to take on something impossible. So when I see Joe Gebbia, the co-founder of Airbnb, man, you know, like, you know Frodo, like in Lord of the Rings, it's kind of shaking, it's kind of like, you know, <laughs> you know, like, you know like, like a Joe, is like, oh my gosh, he feels a total Frodo face, you know? Because he's got, he has the ring on. He was doing his best, you know? I said, Joe, do your best. I'm like Sam, Say, you know, Frodo, it's gonna be okay, <laughs> you know? The beautiful Shire needs you, you know? And, uh, and, uh, but that's what it's like to, to take that route, and he just, he just keeps recovering. He keeps becoming a new person again. Yeah. Um, that's inspiring. So I invite all of you to, to think of your futures as uh, a canvas for all kinds of activities. One of them is leading. And again, people who are creative don't like to lead because they're always working against the man. And suddenly you become the man. You're like, ah, that person's bossy. Oh my gosh, you're bossy. You know, I don't like to be bossy. I'm not the, I'm not the bossy person, you know? But creativity, creative leaders don't boss. They inspire people to, to do things. They move them to change. They don't use authority. They use inspiration. They don't say that they're right. They say maybe they're right. They allow ambiguity to occur. And when there's ambiguity, people are more likely to come in, right? Like if I'm like, right, I'm right, you're wrong. You're like, uh -huh, I don't want to be part of it. Like, I'm Oh, come on, let's talk about this. <laughs> yeah. So it's like a little Jack Sparrow, like, you know, oh, I don't know, like in Jack, Sp you know, Jack Sparrow, where he does this kind of thing. And Tony Depp, um, I'm like, oh, I don't really know. And then people come in. Yeah. But again, in crisis, things change. They say well, every crisis is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a price to pay in everything. Um, like, like making something, like who's made, who's like a sculptor? Who's like made something out of metal? Metal? Isn't that hard? <laughs> metal is really hard. I never knew this. I was making, like, I was like making a, this is before like water jet cutters or whatever, you know. I was making it like this, took a, took a solid block of aluminum and like made it into silverware. That was took forever. I was sitting there like six months. I was like, you know, like, you know, like grinding this thing and like, oh, that looks kind of like a fork. <laughs> so then, my arms are hurting, you know. And, because metal is really, really hard, right? And so like, your body pays the toll. So I don't think it's unlike anything else if you're an extreme person. Different kind of thing. It's an interesting medium. It needs your perspective. Look into it. Yeah. Great. I just have a couple of questions, and then I'm going to throw it out to the audience. But the first one is, um, what, would you, what, was your, what would you say has your, been your best design decision? Mm. I think my, um, my best design decision, let's see here. People often ask me, what was my best design or best whatever? I don't really have a good answer for that. Because like all creative people, I don't like what I do. Um, I, I'm always very doubtful. Like I'm very confident that I have no confidence in what I make. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I don't really know. Is that really good? I'm not sure, you know. And then 
I'm always sort of like suspect when someone says that's good. I said, well, is that good? You know, because like if I think it's good, then I'm stuck, right? Because someone says like that is so good, you're like oh, badass. <laughs> and then like and once you see that kind of come in, people get a little bit weaker, you know. So I'm like, I just don't, I don't really know if that's really good or not. Um, um, so, but in terms of decisions, I think the best decisions I made have been decisions around um, not being afraid. Mm. Um, I think it's really easy to be afraid of change or um, just taking on things, like even doing this, this new role. Um, it's scary. I don't know if I can do that, you know, and even now it's like, I don't know if I'm going to succeed. I have no idea. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a place where I know that I have to grow to meet it. Mm -hmm. And if I can't, I will suffer the consequences but I made myself do that, um, that's kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my last question, maybe you can see this coming a mile away, maybe see the same answer, but what was your worst design decision? My worst? Oh, like every yeah. one of them. Oh, no, no, name one. Pick, oh, pick among, among all of the among, real bad among crap. All what the is the bad worst? Ones? Yeah, the worst Ooh, of the worst. Ooh, let's yeah. see. Like, I think the worst decision I ever made was uh, agreeing to sitting in a sand pit in London for four days because my gallerist friends said it'd be really cool. Um, and it was in winter, and it was in the second floor of a building from the 1700s, mm. and it was cold, and then there was like a sand pit and a chair, and they said, by the way, we've invited anyone in London to come to talk to you, uh, back to back. Uh, and I was like, man, for 10 minutes, like back to back, for six hours a day. And uh, by the third day, I couldn't talk anymore because it was like people kept coming in and knocking the door. I said, new person in. I didn't realize some people might be crazy. I'm not sure. So I'm just talking to them, like hanging out with them for, and drawing the sand. And uh, man, I was like, what a dumb idea. Uh, but learn a lot <laughs> in the process. <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is, you know, like, it's kind of, I realize that people will say when you're by themselves, they'll tell you all kind of things, you know, like, whoa, they give me all this, I'm not your therapist, but I'm, I mean, I'll listen, you know, and, and the second thing I learned is that I learned that the essence of being a leader is that you're someone that people look to for the, the ability to be heard. Mm -hmm. And if you can hear, you begin to get to do something, which is, I'm sure you do it all the time as a leader. Oh, so-and-so came, and so-and-so came. And after all, he's like, oh, wait a second, you should see that person. And we're like, you should, that person should hang out with those two people. And so you begin to, you begin to be able to enable other connections to occur. Mm -hmm. That's what I kept doing. Like, you know, someone said, like, you know, I want to do this. Oh, I'll talk to this person, you know, and I met them yesterday. Or you begin to sort of knit together a kind of a, a system. So through failure, I found like, oh, this is a, another way to live life. Um, and I also had more gratitude for being a president. I thought, man, much easier to be a president than to sit here in the sand for like in London. <laughs> God, I was like, whoa, it's so much easier to, to do what I did. So I was more grateful uh -huh. for not having to live like that. So through the negative thing, you can you can generally find something. I always try to find that, you know, try to not let it sit inside you because it can eat away at you. Like one of my great uh, mentors, um, uh, my favorite guy, uh, Bob DiMuccio, he's an insurance company that's very beloved in New England. Um, he said to me uh, about, you know, getting angry, or about having a bad day. Uh, you know, people usually cause bad days, not just the weather. So he said, uh, John, you should be sure. You should, uh, he, said, he said, holding a grudge is like against someone. is like eating poison and hoping the other person dies. <laughs> it's really true. It's like, you know, like, oh, wait a second. Like, I'm like, all bent out of shape, and that person is totally fine. Uh, they're not going to die. <laughs> and I'm like sitting there like, oh. So I like that. I like, How do you recast? the situation and get free from something. I am not a free person that way. That's why I use Twitter so much as public therapy. It's a kind of like, like, okay, I gotta recover, I gotta recover, I gotta recover. Um, so that's what I hmm. think about failure. So I'm gonna open up to you guys. Any, any questions?
questions. I'm sure lots of things have been going on in your brain, at least mine, from hearing John. Yes? So, um, what is your view? So in terms of where, whereby design is often viewed as a visual arts kind of, kind of view, but um, in industry whereby design predominantly doesn't exist, things like environment, energy, or space, how do you think design can get a buy-in? Or what do you think is the role of design in the areas like that? Well, you know, I, I kind of have a, I'm not sure. Um, I'll say two things on that. First of all, um, you know, when I worked on the STEM to STEAM work at RISD, um, it came from the fact that um, uh, someone who worked in science education told me this. He said that um, science educators fought for a long time to elevate the importance of science education in America, and no one would listen. But so they try to elevate it. Look, it's really important. Look, it's really important. And the whole landscape shifted when they stopped elevating it and instead just revealed its importance. And I thought that was really important reframing. So when I was doing design advocate, advocacy, I would never elevate it. I would just say, look, it's already happening. You know, it's just look at, look, here it is, you know. And that was important because what I found in the arts fields in general was a strong victim mentality. Like, oh my gosh, you know. You know, we never get a, we, we're always the lowest. We don't get a whatever, you know. And that's a pretty weak platform to operate from, you know. Um, I never felt it uh, stronger um, uh, until when um, I realized that um, when my kids, uh, when, they're in ele when they were in ele elementary school, my older ones, there was this thing called the Walk for the Arts. It was like a yearly thing. And you walk around the school and you make, People like you know, the parents sponsor it and walk for the arts, supports the arts, gets like art supplies for the school, for the teachers, you know. And it's always bugged me, <laughs> you know. And then it wasn't until uh, the uh, then provost, Jesse Shepherd, and I said, what, 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 why, why, this really bugs me, why is it? And she said, well, John, it's because it makes the arts seem like there's some kind of disease that needs to be eradicated or supported. You know, support the arts, you know. It's like, so the arts, the way that's been situated, I think is a, is, is a losing proposition. So revealing its importance, showing where it's winning, has been important to me uh, for a long time. And so that's the kind of thing I'm trying to craft, uh, whether it's around uh, how a company is identified or how the product exists in relationship to the market. Um, um, so that's what I'm trying to do right now, or bring in unsuspecting uh, new opportunities that have nothing to do with, business, nothing to do with design. Like most people think that design things look pretty. Like, oh my gosh, this thing is so beautiful, right? And I'm like, well, yeah, but that's not what design's about. But it's beautiful, right? I mean, designers all love it. And the thing is that designers can't help but love it. You know, designers, like 10 designers love it. Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. So like, you know, heart, it was that kind of like, like, like <laughs> all over the place, you know? So I can't argue against it, but I, can all, but, but I can advocate for the fact that, well, you know, just because it looks good doesn't mean that everyone's going to use it. Um, it has to be meaningful. Um, and sometimes something ugly is actually the best design ever. Um, so that's the perspective I've been trying to bring. I have not succeeded yet at making this more of a common, common view of, in that region, but uh, I will try my best. Let me know. Okay, <laughs> you know. I'll put it on Twitter. I did it. <laughs> I, probably, I probably wouldn't say that. <laughs> Anna, go ahead. Um, so you're talking about situation changing in leadership roles yes. that can actually step up. So one of the situations that um, I find myself in is uh, the technology right now. Technology yeah. is leading. And what I find is that when the technology is complex, it's up to the UX designers or the interaction designers mm -hmm. to actually make the interaction simple for the audience. Now, how do we approach all these problems and not dumb it down so simplicity is stupi uh, stupidity. 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 <laughs> stupidity. Yeah. Exactly. And how the like, methods that we can actually drive our company or in our position, how do we yeah. make that leadership stand saying that, look, we need, to, we as a culture have to drive technology and not follow technology. Well, there's, uh, I mean, there's three things around that. First is that um, 
I think that designers who fight for usability is generally a losing stance because it sounds like you're fighting for something. Like, oh my gosh, we got to da da da, we've got to whatever, you know, and people get kind of religious about it. And then everyone gets like feeling really warm in the room. And then like, you know, someone says, well, the more, what was it? Um, uh, there's this um, great movie that, uh, okay, my, I forget my provost, my pro, former provost, Jesse Shefford. She's in the leadership book all over the place. She loves that, by the way. But anyways, <laughs> Jesse, Jesse asked me to watch the movie Buck. Have you seen Buck? Buck is a documentary. You can watch it on Netflix, uh, 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 digital, whatever kind of thing. So it's like part of your subscription. Uh, but anyways, um, uh, Buck is a movie about a horse trainer. There was a movie, Robert Redford, The Horse Whisperer. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, uh, it's all about this guy who was the, the real model for the horse whisperer. He's a real guy, and he travels all around the United States training owners how to take care of their horses. And because like oftentimes they're, they're kind of like a wealthy person, like, I want a horse, yeah! be awesome to have a horse, you know, but the horse is like a living thing. It's like, it's like larger than a dog. It's dangerous. So like, you know, the horse is a little wild, you know, and like, how do you get the horse to calm down? So he'll, he'll walk in and he'll, you know, the owner is like, I can't take care of my horse. He just walks in, the horse goes, ah. the horse, the horse is just kind of like hangs out with Buck and like, how'd you do that? Whatever, you know. And the best example I saw is, set up. maybe can they come this way? Yeah, no, I, I want to hurt you. Uh, he just graduated, so uh, there's, there, there, there's a scene where uh, there's a scene where um, hang over here. There's a scene where don't worry, I want to hurt you. Uh, you know, I'll be the horse. But anyways, right oh, no, 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 no. So uh, the scene where he says to the owner, "Here, hold my hand." Okay, now, uh, now uh, I'm the horse. Now pull on me. What am I doing? Pulling back. Pulling back. So can you pull me? It's kind of hard, right? Yeah. Now, 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 try again. Pull me. Yeah, following you, see? So it's like, why am I following you? I'm <laughs> following you. So it's like, if, I, if I'm pulling you, if, I, if, I, if you follow me, come with me. See, we're just moving around. Do you see? But if you pull back, we can't go anywhere. So that, to answer your question is that, how do you remove that resistance in a person? Is because if he's like, you know, like, you don't like UX, you don't like UX, I'm not, I don't like this, I'm gonna pull back on you, I'm gonna fight with you. So like, how do you remove the fight uh, is a question, number one. Uh, number two is that the whole UX field is, is damaged by the fact that, to your point, technology is made first, and then the interface is made. Why is that? It's because it's generally hard to make technology. And so you spend all the money making the rocket. And then after the rocket, look, it worked. Well, let's now make it usable. Right? That was the common way things worked. But since 2012 or so, it's been easier to make technology. Technology is easier to make. So because of that, designers can play a different role if they're, earlier, if they're involved early in a product's construction, then they actually don't have to fight. So to UX people who are oh, good at what they do, you know, I suggest that they don't try to fight a losing battle and choose a winning battle. If you have people who are like, right now you can't sell a good uh, a service if the design isn't good. So you find like a small engineering group, whatever that knows this, connect with them. And now what happens is you've built design into the culture. So it doesn't become a thing. Um, the third thing is that I think that uh, UX design as a whole um, has a big challenge because of the multi-platform issue. You know, it used to be we would design for like, you know, 640 by 480, yeah. and the 800 by 600, and it was, then it became the browser. Oh no, what size is the thing? I'm not sure. Then it was Netscape and like, you know, Explorer and like Firefox or whatever. And then and now like this generation, it's really bad. Because yeah. <laughs> like you know, Android, you've got yeah. iOS, you've got Pad, you've got non-Pad, you've got like desktop, you've got TV, you know, you've got like, you know, and, and, and then you have like, you know, Samsung Android versus HTC Android. <laughs> and like, that? like, it's kind of impossible to design anything now. So um, I think that your generation 
to find a voice in that ecosystem is going to be hugely difficult. So to that point, congratulations. It's a great challenge. <laughs> and whoever can figure that out will be successful at restoring balance to the force. You see that? <laughs> so there you go. Three things. There you go. That's your question? Yes. Good. Thanks. OK. Do you have a question? Saying her questions like we're trying to find the balance ecosystem. But I think it's in a way kind of the done also the web standards community <coughs> with like coding and CSS. So it's just, it can be done, but it will take a while. Well, that's a question of what you're trying to do. So I always recommend uh, when I'm more sane is to uh, make a checklist. <laughs> Like, so what are the three things you think you might get done and just go after it? Because it's like this question about the web and you know, standards, whatever. Like I guess I have such sympathy for what you're going through <laughs> because really it's bad. Because um, once iOS begins to crumble and Android starts picking up, I mean, Android is like MS-DOS brought back to life. And not only that, it, it runs on multiple platforms, right? And so I just think that Somewhere in this, um, think analytically. You know, if I were to go out to design and think about this space, I would find, I would calculate the, the, the platform with the largest market share and do a really good job at designing for that and just like, ignore everything else. So how do you pick the right bet and then go after it? Uh, number two. I say, hang out with the standards people. I say, hey, you want to go for a drink? <laughs> you want to hang, hang out? You know, it's just infiltrate, infiltrate, infiltrate. <laughs> yeah, go to the you know, go to the mixers, you know, <laughs> you know, just keep going, and maybe you can influence it slowly that way too. Uh, but don't waste your time. Do both, you know. Can't choose one round, do both. Yes. Yeah. What's necessary? You need a leader who cares about design. It's really as simple as that. And let me tell you why you usually don't have a leader who cares about design. Uh, because the leader isn't a designer. <laughs> 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 You know, like if, if you didn't like grow up with it, it's kind of like, you know, I noticed that some people just can't stand sushi. You know, like, God, I can't stand that stuff, you know? And like, I would never go out and eat sushi, you know, because they never ate sushi when they were kids, you know? Or like, they never had a good sushi experience, too. Not too. So think of Nike. Uh, the CEO of Nike is an industrial designer. So. You know, and, and you can think you could count on your like you know maybe like your hand your list hand or whatever that there's not many companies that run by designers so it's no shock that design isn't important but whether you're not even if you're not a designer if you're a business person you kind of care about money and you care about winning so if design becomes a part of winning money. See that sentence? <laughs> <laughs> then you know, like, I, I kind of want to figure this design thing out. So I mean, I mean, just the odds that John Donahoe would call me up and say, "Hey, you know me, I need your help." And I'm like, "Whoa, that's like too crazy!" Like he runs like a, like a multi-billion dollar. Like, I can't do anything. <laughs> but at least he's like reaching out of the ether to kind of say, "Hey, guy, maybe you can help." And I, I, under, I, I can't do that, you know, but I'll try. These kind of things, take, give me an example. So my friend who used to run um, design for uh, um, Toyota and GM and then Pininfarina. Pinin uh, uh, he said to me once how like by living in all the cultures, he learned something. He learned in GM because the product cycles were so long, mm. they couldn't adapt to the market. You know, to make a GM car, you'd plan it seven years ahead. So like, I'm going to make a car that's going to be made seven years from now. And so he said one time, yeah, he, started, he, he realized the, the fallacy of this when he realized that G, GM people thought that one day when the fax machine was a big rage, that every car would have a fax machine. <laughs> so, so they planned in like 1990, whatever. Like this, every, so like, like seven years rolling, there was a spot 
for the fax machine. <laughs> you know, so that, that, that speed, you know, uh, is different. So anyways, yeah, anything else? Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's maybe one last question and then we'll wrap it up. What is your philosophy of design or what is design? Oh, uh, well, that's the easy answer there. That is why I created whatisdesign.net. Uh, <laughs> that was easy, which I haven't really tended to. Which I was, every day I was trying to figure out what is design, so I was posting different things of what I think it is. Um, what is design now, uh, 2014, as of this moment? Um, I think that, well, um, I think that design is as simple as establishing a relationship between something and an audience. Simple as that. And it's also a decision not to do design. Now that's important. Um, abstaining from design is important as designing. And to give you a concrete example, there's something called Mary Meeker's Internet Trends Report. Every year there's someone named Mary Meeker who publishes this thing called Internet Trends Report. It's like 150 slides, PowerPoint slides that the industry all picks up. Like a, and SlideShare, it's number one shared resource, you know? And so uh, this year, because I, and, and she's at Kleiner Perkins. And so this year, when she published it, you know, uh, Business Insider, it's a website, like says, you know, publishes the trend report. And of course, like all media does, the next thing they publish is like, and these slides suck, <laughs> you know, because they're designed so poorly. They're so ugly. They're so ugly, you know? And so immediately people say, like, well, John, my head is there. Well, why didn't he fix the design? Like, he's a design partner. What's wrong with him, you know? And, and my whole point is that if her slides were designed, they'd lose integrity. I mean, these are people making crunching data. The data isn't meant to be beautiful or interpreted. It's meant to be data for us all to consume and use. And so, like if I were to say, like they had a design or redesign the slides, and I'm kind of like, well, like, any, what do you do? You know, monocolor, you know, all green shades, you know, icons, hierarchies, you know. But in the end, there's no data anymore. It's all interpretation. Um, so design is about getting out of the way, not thinking that what you do here is, uh, is important, because sometimes it isn't. Um, another example is um, car design. Uh, I always think of this when I get lost. Um, this is by Mr. Holmes in seventh grade English, who I remember because he had a big mustache. And uh, Mr. Holmes read Reader's Digest, which used to be a popular <laughs> yeah, activity, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> so uh, and he said how, like, you know, imagine the car of 20, you know, 2000. This is in the 70s. Imagine the car of, the, of 2000. You know, it has, like, these things called airbags, computer-controlled, you know, it's perfectly, like, safe, you know. And then imagine a car where there's no protection and there's a steering wheel where the steering column has a knife pointed directly at you. He says, which will you drive more safely? You think about that. And they're like, oh, well, of course this one, because you're more afraid you're going to die. So and this is a bad design. But what to make more conscious uh, is a good design. It isn't about typography or color or like proportion. Sometimes it's a decision like what makes the most sense, and it's hard to remember that. Mm -hmm. For me, yeah. So maybe it's hard for you sometimes, but yeah. That's great. So don't design. <laughs> <laughs> Is design. Yeah. So, so I want to thank John. Uh, it's really been generous with his answers, and uh, a really a big round of applause for John. Thank you. Thank you.